And our first, our first speaker uh, this morning is uh, Andre Bourgeois. And Andre uh, from first studied medicine in, in Canada. Initially, he studied uh, actually um, uh, biochemistry and then moved on and did uh, anesthesia in Toronto before coming to uh, West Australia to uh, work at the Charles Gardner Hospital uh, with his wife and uh, has now uh, just recently moved to Middlemore Hospital, uh, as his, uh, which is where his wife uh, hailed from originally. He's got special interests in acute pain management, perioperative care and in transthoracic echo. And today he's going to talk to us about the future of uh, preoperative cardiac evaluation. Please welcome Andre to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for skipping church for this. All right. Um, so we'll, we'll start off with disclosures and conflicts of interest. I, I have absolutely none. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> I have no intellectual conflicts of interest in this topic either. For those of you who know me, uh, I'm actually a guy who's really interested in acute pain. Um, I'm also uh, a regionalist. Um, and so this is perhaps an unusual topic for me to talk about, but hopefully I'll, I'll elucidate uh, to you today why, why it is we're talking about this. I'm not a published author in this field, nor do I have any vested publication interests on this topic. So that might lead you to ask, why is this bozo coming and talking to us about uh, this topic? Um, and the story behind that um, is a little bit uh, longer than perhaps I would like it to be, but as <clears throat> um, the moderator was saying, uh, I am a Canadian, uh, and I'm not just a Canadian, I'm Canadian trained. Uh, I did my uh, medical schooling uh, in Montreal at McGill, after which I moved to Toronto where I did all of my anesthesia training. Uh, and while I was doing that anesthesia training, uh, I met uh, a lovely uh, little girl who uh, initially uh, hailed from Kiwiland, uh, and had trained in, in Australia as well. Uh, and <clears throat> it turns out that my wife didn't really love uh, the Canadian weather. Uh, it's, <laughs> it can be a pretty, uh, a pretty hard uh, year sometimes, uh, and there was always a plan for us to return to Australasia. So in 2015, I uh, moved uh, to Perth, and I was working at Sir Charles Gardner for the better part of the last two years. Um, recently, I've moved on to... Uh, to New Zealand, to uh, Middlemore Hospital, where my wife originally hails from. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, I'm telling you this because as a Canadian trained anesthetist and as a Canadian, perhaps my perspective is a little bit different. And certainly, uh, the kind of literature that I'll follow on a regular basis might be a little bit different than somebody, for example, who's trained fully in Australasia. Because I'm uh, ashamed to say I'm a millennial, uh, I do still speak daily with a lot of my friends from around the world, uh, and so uh, we're keeping in touch, and so I hear about a lot of these topics coming up uh, in anesthesia that are, for example, affecting Canadians, but that, that perhaps you won't hear about uh, in Australasia quite as much. And last year something happened, something very important that was widely talked about um, in Canada. Uh, and I'm not talking, uh, of course, about uh, all that snow. That's just every Tuesday in January where I come from. Um, I'm talking about the publication of these guidelines by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. These were initially published in, I believe, late October 2016 online. Uh, and uh, were truly published in early uh, January 2017. And these guidelines uh, were a drastic um, change uh, from what most Canadians had followed uh, to date. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not here to tell you these are, you know, the future of uh, perioperative cardiac workup. I'm here to tell you this has happened. This has come out. It really shook the Canadian anesthesia uh, community. Uh, it certainly has been spreading to the United States. These guidelines were brought about because the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, which is the Canadian version of the ACCAHA, for example, uh, felt that there was a need for an up-to-date cardiac guideline uh, for patients who were to undergo non-cardiac surgery. Uh, and they wanted to use a systematized uh, a system of evidence assessment to do that. Uh, 
A one sentence summary of these guidelines as given by one of the, the co-investigators, Joel Parlow, who's a guy who's the head of anesthesia at uh, Queen's University, that these guidelines shift the emphasis dramatically from preoperative non-invasive cardiac testing to an increased use of biomarkers for post-operative monitoring of patients at risk and the management to the cardiac complications that come with it. So that's already a bit of a shocking statement because the use of biomarkers really hasn't been that prominent to date in most of the guidelines that we are using, uh, which usually are from 2014. And in Australia, a lot of this went under the radar. I was practicing here in Perth at the time, uh, you know, chatting daily with my friends from back home in Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal, and uh, nobody here uh, understandably had heard about this because it was very much a Canadian topic when it started. So everything was going as per usual. And meanwhile in Canada, people were losing their minds. Interestingly, this picture is what comes up as the first Google search when you look up for Canadian riot. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Um, but in reality, yes, a lot of you know, Canadian anesthetists uh, were a, a little bit, uh, let's say, taken aback and upset by these guidelines. Uh, but in academia, there was a real fight going on. And that, can, that culminated in a very recent um, uh, exchange uh, at the CAS meeting, which is basically the Canadian equivalent of this very meeting, the Canadian Anesthesiologist Society, which happened in Niagara Falls just a few months ago in June 2017, where there was a two-hour plenary session where um, some of the investigators of uh, uh, these new guidelines uh, presented basically uh, what they thought we should be doing, and then having a counterpoint by uh, Joshua Beckman from Vanderbilt University, who's one of the authors of the ACC AHA 2014 guidelines, and it was contentious. Uh, it was a really heated debate. Uh, in fact, I didn't have the opportunity to make it to Niagara Falls for that meeting. I just podcasted in, and I had to stop several times during the podcast just to take a break because it was that uncomfortable at times. So in the end, maybe I'm just a Canadian in the wrong place at the wrong time, but I think this is a really interesting topic. Um, and that's why I'm here today, because I think this is something really interesting that has happened. I don't think it's going to be simply contained uh, to Canada. I think it's something that we're gonna be talking a lot more about over the coming years, and that's why I'm here to tell you about it. So these are the guidelines. I highly recommend you just kind of Google on your phone, CCS Guidelines Cardiac Risk. Uh, it'll be the first hit that comes up. You can download it for free and read it later. Just have a good look at it. There's a lot of good things in, this, uh, in these guidelines, uh, but as I said, they are quite contentious and you're certainly not gonna agree with everything that's in it. Uh, but it is quite uh, evidence-based. Uh, there's also an appendix that comes with it where they really go through all the evidence that they've um, looked at. Uh, so it's a very interesting paper at the very least. So as I was saying, most of us really to date have been following the, the ESC, ESA guidelines or uh, perhaps more commonly for Canadians such as myself, the ACCHA guidelines on perioperative cardiovascular evaluation of patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Um, and that's really the guidelines that I've been relying on to date to be able to assess some of these patients that I'm seeing preoperatively or more commonly who are coming to my pre-op clinic. And this, <clears throat> this little diagram is, is something that uh, I think you know, many, if not most of us, are relying on to be able to um, you know, break down how we should further assess this patient um, and whether uh, that's needed. And we'll come back to this guideline a few times as I'm presenting these kind of new CCS guidelines to show how it's completely broken down um, uh, this, this diagram and gone a completely different direction. So let's delve in a little bit. The first thing that the Canadian Cardiovascular Society looked at that I want to talk about today is, is uh, basically the uh, um, assessment or patient self-reported functional capacity, better known as METS. Um, and it was interesting to me to look at the data that's in the CCS guidelines, in particular the appendix, because um, it really proved to me that actually there's very little, uh, there's limited data uh, surrounding the use of METS, which uh, the ACCHA guidelines uh, rely heavily on, and I must say has been to me a crux of my perioperative evaluation of these patients. The best evidence that exists out there actually seems to show that the METs are not predictive of major cardiac events, and they actually strongly suggest that there's, there's a lot of observer bias in the estimation of METs. There's a large prospective cohort study uh, that's currently undergoing and is due to publish this year uh, that's basically evaluating the prognostic capabilities of a physician's assessment of patient METs versus other measures. Um, 
But given the limitations of what we have so far, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society panel decided not to make any recommendations on the use of self-reported functional capacity in their guideline. And if you look at the ACCHA 2014, you can see that that's actually a really important part of uh, their, their, uh, their scheme to be able to assess the patients. And so the CCS has completely done away with this. Stress testing, uh, interestingly, uh, also seems to have fairly limited data according to the CCS assessment. Uh, there's not that many studies, only a few have been risk adjusted, and the ones that seem to be any good seem to show that there's no significant association between any ST changes uh, and death or MI for exercise stress testing. Cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, which had some fairly large studies come out in the past few years, again, seems to show maybe you know, they'd be a weak independent predictor of mortality at five years, but anything that's looking at 30-day mortality has actually had inconsistent results. In addition, stress testing, which again, they break down for over six pages in the appendix of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines, um, they conclude that really there's a lot of small sample size studies with limited number of events in them and few were prospective and few reported risk-adjusted associations. And so they conclude that none adequately assess the incremental value of the stress tests above, say, let's say, uh, a Lee revised cardiac risk index, so it's probably not that useful. And that's the recommendations that they give. They strongly recommend uh, against performing uh, preoperative exercise stress tests, strongly recommend against um, CPEX, uh, as well as um, scintiography. Um, and so that's, that's rather surprising to a lot of people because, again, that's a crux of uh, the ACCHA. They do mention here in the values of preferences that the panel believed that the cost of these and the delays that are entailed meant that, therefore, they couldn't be that useful in terms of assessing the patients moving forward to surgery and that they felt that perhaps, and we'll get to that, there were better ways uh, to do this. But cost and time definitely factored into these strong recommendations. However, these are based on what even the CCS admits to be weak evidence. So that removes a big part again uh, of the ACCHA guidelines where they recommend, you know, for patients who don't have good exercise tolerance and who are at higher risk to get some pharmacological stress testing, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and their latest guidelines basically say that we don't need that anymore. A quick thought might be that, yes, lack of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of uselessness. Um, and I think that's what's led to a lot of the contention here, where a lot of people uh, for the ACCAHA, for example, uh, feel that perhaps like Joshua Beckman was trying to make the point that uh, we can't really be throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and there's perhaps some room for this uh, in future guidelines, uh, but the CCS did not go that way. Now, the one thing that they talk about a lot and is fairly new uh, in the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines is the use of biomarkers, and in particular, BNP, brain natriuretic peptide, and troponins. And those are kind of the two that we'll talk about briefly today. And their recommendation is that we should be measuring uh, NT pro BNP or BNP, which are two kind of related molecules. We'll get to that for those of you who don't know that much about BNP. Um, before cardiac surgery to enhance the perioperative cardiac risk estimation. Now, that's kind of a big thing, because previously the ACCAHA, as well as the ESA, had basically made strong recommendations against looking at these kind of things. It is based on moderate quality evidence, but there's been a mountain of information coming out on BNP in particular, as well as troponins in the past three years since the ACCAHA was published uh, in 2014. In their values and preference, what they talk about in terms of uh, looking at thresholds and who they should be testing, the, the committee uh, for the Canadian Cardiovascular Society decided that really we should be testing anybody who's at a higher risk of 5% of uh, a major cardiac event or death uh, in the perioperative period. And a lot of that was based on the vision study, which we'll touch on briefly afterwards as well. Um, now, BNP is something that probably many of you have heard about, but maybe uh, a lot of anesthetists still don't know much about. It's been a big topic of conversation, certainly within 
the cardiolo cardiology literature, but it's only slowly making its way to anesthesia. And as I said, this is perhaps the first time where we do have some national guidelines that are strongly recommending starting to look at this. BNP has a very bad, uh, it was very badly named, brain natriuretic peptide. Um, it's a hormone produced by cardiomyocytes in the ventricles, uh, and it's in response to stretching. It's caused by increased volume. So it's a marker of ventricular stretch. So why the brain in it? Well, actually, because it was initially discovered back in the 1980s in the brain of a pig. Um, and the name just stuck. It's also referred to now, because of that confusion, as B-type natriuretic peptide, sometimes ventricular natriuretic peptide, which is probably a better name, or natriuretic peptide. I think it should be called ventricular stretch hormone, but nobody ever listens to me. So this is just looking at what BNP looks like within a cardiomyocyte. Um, so initially, it's this pro-molecule called pro-BNP, and in response to stretching, it will be cleaved by the enzyme corin. What that then causes is BNP to be secreted out of the cell, and um, the, other, uh, the other little bit called NT-proBNP, N-terminal end of the proBNP molecule, to also be uh, secreted. It turns out that the NT-proBNP sticks around for a little bit longer, uh, sometimes up to two hours, whereas uh, the BNP itself only has a mode of action that lasts for about 20 minutes, or sorry, a half-life of about 20 minutes. It's not just natriuretic either, which is why it's not a great name. Yes, it does create natriuresis, but it also creates vasodilatation. And it helps remodel the heart to a degree, right? At least to some hypertrophy, uh, anti-hypertrophy, sorry, and anti-fibrosis actions within it. And it does, it does have some brain actions because it inhibits the sympathetic nervous system. Um, but BNP is still, I believe, a very bad name for it. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that camp. So as I was saying, biomarkers, when they were previously discussed uh, by uh, the ESC, ESA, for example, in their 2014 guidelines, they found that you know, the level of evidence behind the use of BNP, NT-proBNP, um, was not great evidence so far. There was some data derived from some single randomized clinical trials, but they didn't recommend strongly towards it. And they said, well, you can consider measuring it, but actually we strongly recommend against universal preoperative routine biomarker sampling. And that was just in 2014 by the European Society of Cardiology. In turn, the ACCAHA in America uh, also made a strong statement saying that there were no data to suggest that targeting these biomarkers for treatment and intervention would reduce the postoperative risk. And so, it was essentially recommended against looking at them. So what, pray tell, what new evidence has come to light since 2014 that would lead the Canadian Cardiovascular Society to justify these drastic changes in recommendation? Well, a few things came out, but in particular, there's two fairly large meta-analyses that came out in 2014 with good numbers, um, in particular this one by Rod Seth et al., um, that confirmed the previous findings um, that uh, basically, these are very good markers for perioperative badness. And if you look at it, any sort of elevation in NT-proBNP above 300 nanograms per liter or BNP above 92 milligrams per liter um, leads to a one in five chance at least of having bad perioperative outcomes, which is to say to have an MI or death within the 30 days following surgery. That's a very bad prognostic marker, isn't it? And all the data that's been coming out since then seems to confirm this. So having an elevated BNP, certainly above 92, is a very bad thing. So is preoperative elevated BNP or NT-proBNP prognostically bad? Well, almost incontrovertibly, all the evidence that seems to be coming out since that time seems to show that it's very, very bad to have an elevation. And it's got an excellent negative predictive value because if it's normal, then really, you probably have not much to worry about. There's no ventricular stretch. We should be okay. Some of this data came out in 2014, so of course it wasn't available to the ACCHA or the ESC. Uh, and that's why perhaps there was a feel in Canada that they needed to redo these guidelines. But what does it mean? What does it mean when the BNP is elevated? Because, yeah, sure, it means a one in five chance of more MIs uh, or death but it can be caused by a bunch of things. It's not very specific to anything, is it? 
It can be caused by heart failure. Ischemia of any kind seems to bring up the BNP. Pulmonary hypertension routinely shows that there's elevated BNPs. Chronic AF can also have elevated BNPs. There's a lot of different conditions that you look through the literature will cause an elevation in BNPs. So it's not really telling you something specific about what's happening, except you do know that an ele elevation really means prognostically something bad. So this is what the CCS guidelines look like. This is what they've, this is the, the, the diagram that they've created where basically they break down patients into the timing of surgery. So whether it's an emergency surgery, urgent, semi-urgent surgery, or an elective surgery. And if you follow the elective surgery pathway over here, if you're non-elective, really, they say, you know, just make a good clinical decision, uh, but they're not asking you to do anything. In the elective surgeries, you do a cardiac risk assessment. They recommend uh, the revised cardiac risk index, um, but others have been using, for example, the Gupta index or uh, other things that have come out of NSQIP. Um, and if the patient has any sort of risk factor, is over 65 years of age, or if they're younger and have any sort of cardiac problems, well, then they get an NT pro BNP or a BNP. And then depending on what the value of that is, then there's a decision that, well, if you've got a negative BNP, if it's below the threshold, then move on to surgery. Nothing, nothing else needs to be investigated. But if it's elevated, they don't at that point, because they don't, they recommend strongly against any sort of, you know, stress testing. They say, well, you're going to have to pay a little bit more attention in the post-operative period. And that means basically measuring the troponins daily for 48 to 72 hours. It means obtaining an ECG in the PACU and then considering what they call in-hospital shared care management, which might mean sending a patient to the high dependency unit or more commonly for patients who aren't, let's say, candidates for that, uh, to have other um, services involved, internal medicine, perhaps geriatrics, to be able to follow these patients more often. And perhaps they suggest, you know, they should get more often, vi they should get vitals more often so that we can um, find one of these sentinel events as they happen. Now, these tropes are a huge um, topic of contention right now. We could spend an entire lecture talking about it. Um, a few things to note from the guideline, though, there's a complete absence of surgical grading. They will add on the revised cardiac risk index a point if you're doing a high-risk surgery, let's say an open AAA, for example. Um, but they don't really look at the surgical grading in the same way that the ACCHA did. There's a huge amount of BNP and trope testing. Like, if you're over 65, really? Like, that's most of our population. We're seeing a huge amount of geriatrics coming through. And if you have at least, you know, let's say diabetes that's insulin dependent, then also you should be getting this. So a lot of people would be getting, under this scheme, BNP testing. Um, and I'd, I'd be ready to wager that many of you have not been, you know, asking for BNP. So you don't even know, like, is that available in my hospital? How quickly can I get that result back? Um, and that's a very fair question. It's not applicable to ambulatory surgery. And if you're going to be taking these tropes in high-risk patients, that means that, you know, they got to stay more than just overnight. So let's say you're having a breast surgery in a high-risk patient, then you got to keep them for, what, three days while you're taking tropes every day to see what's going to happen. Um, that's a little bit contentious. And if you don't have easy BNP testing, which I realize is not available everywhere, it is increasingly available, though, and it's surprising. Like, you might be surprised if you call within your hospital to see what kind of BNP testing is available. But like at Middlemore Hospital, where I work right now, I called them up recently, and it's, you know, it's 30 bucks to get it done, and you get a result within two hours. At Charlie's here in Perth, it'd be about $50. For whatever reason, it's that much more expensive, um, and you'd get it within half a day. But that's not going to be available in every hospital for sure. And if you have to be sending these results away, that's problematic. So if you don't have it, and you go back to the previous slide, well, they say, OK, well, then you're just going to be taking these daily tropes all the time. So you're going to have kind of a bad time. As I said, the troponin testing, this topic alone could require an entire lecture. But what they recommended was that if you were at higher risk because of an elevated BNP and the previous risk factors, that you should be getting daily tropes for the first 48 to 72 hours. And that data is coming out of recent studies such as POISE, right? The POISE trial, which is a fairly big trial where they were looking at perioperative beta blockade, showed that about 65% of periop MI, 65% are being missed. They don't have symptoms, and we think they're likely just being masked by painkillers. There's similar increases in 30-day mortality whether or not you had symptoms. So that troponitis is significant. 
So these asymptomatic myocardial infarctions are occurring. They're probably occurring most of the time when we have no idea, and their consequences are real. They then followed that up with a vision trial, which is a huge trial that many of you might actually be involved in because it was in Australia. It was a big multi-center international prospective cohort study. They looked at over 15,000 patients. I think they're over 20,000 now. And they were looking at patients over 45 years for inpatient non-cardiac surgery, and they followed the trope levels for a few days. And a peak fourth generation trope that was over 0.03 nanograms per mil was associated with a marked increase in 30-day mortality, 10%. Versus if you were below that, it was 1%, so a tenfold increase in mortality. They also had the largest population attributable risk of all the complications after surgery. And 84% of these trope elevations in that vision study were completely asymptomatic. So a few things about the high sensitivity trope. These aren't your grandfather's tropes. They aren't the tropes that we were measuring, let's say, back in the 90s or the early 2000s. These are high sensitivity tropes. They're very useful to detect these asymptomatic MIs. At least they've proven that. But there's also lots of other reasons you've probably seen as we've transitioned over to these high sensitivity tropes for an elevation. You're seeing them higher in renal disease, in congestive cardiac failure, even tachycardia, trauma. Postpartum sees elevations in tropes. Sepsis. So... The evidence seems to be fairly good that prognostically they're quite bad, but like the BNP, they're not specific. They're just telling you something terrible is happening. Um, so what do you do with that? What does one do with these elevated post-op tropes? So the ACCAHA, in this big debate that they had at the Canadian Anesthesiologist Society, as rep represented by Dr. Beckman, was basically saying, if we're measuring these things and we know the badness is happening, but we don't know what to do with it, like, is that really worthwhile? We're just getting people to freak out. The CCS would argue that, well, it's going to get you to be a little bit more vigilant in these patients, but there's probably going to be a lot of false negatives if they're really being honest with themselves. And we're really lacking trial data to be able to say whether this is efficacious at all, right? Um, and as well, there's a bit of a conflict of interest there because PJ Devereaux, the guy who's one of the main leads on these Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines. He's a very well-published guy. He's behind POISE. He's behind POISE 2. He's behind uh, a lot of fairly big trials in Canada. Um, he's also very big on these high-sensitivity tropes and following them in the post-op period. Now, he did recuse himself from adjudicating on the use of these in the post-op period, but as one of the co-leads, a lot of Americans, for example, have been joking that these are the PJ Devereaux guidelines. And then there's further evidence that shows that pre-op trope elevations, which seems to be in about one-fifth of the post-op trope elevations, also has uh, some evidence behind it as a very prognostically bad thing. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you whether it's cardiac or not. If you look at the vascular mortality versus non-vascular mortality with an elevated trope, it's exactly the same. It doesn't change, right? Your, your, your hazard ratios are basically equivalent. So you don't know whether an elevated trope is telling you something is bad with the heart or is there something else going on. And this data is from Dr. Beckman uh, from Vanderbilt, who again was uh, giving the counterpoint at the Canadian Anesthesiologist Society meeting three months ago. So I'm sorry. This wouldn't be a Canadian presentation if I wasn't apologizing at least once. Um, but I'm here to tell you this is happening. We're talking about this. It started, as I said, I thought it was fairly contained in Canada. The Americans are getting very involved now. Um, but these have been fairly ambitious and controversial guidelines. It seems to me, looking at all of this, that METS, the stress testing pre-op, revascularization pre-op, there's a lot of poor evidence uh, on the accuracy and the efficacy of these things. And BNP tropes are having a mounting level of evidence that they're actually strong prognostic implications, but they're not specific. So what should we do? Well, I don't really know. And I wish I could tell you today because I don't think the answer is clear. There's a fight going on. But in cases like this, I wonder, well, who might be able to help me? And the first person that I thought of when I wanted to get a better answer as to where we should be going with this is Dominda Widgesundera. Now, I mention Dominda here because he's going to be doing a tour of Australia and New Zealand next year. In fact, he'll be coming to the ASA in um, sunny Adelaide next year. And if you can't make it to Adelaide to see him speak, um, you should certainly come to Auckland the month later in November where he'll be coming. It'll be a little bit less sunny, though. Um, Dominda's a really great guy. 
I had the pleasure of working along Deminda for a very long time, and he's not a big ego. I think I worked with Deminda for about three years before he ever admitted to me that, oh yeah, I happen to be one of the lead, uh, the evidence chair uh, committee for the ACCAHA guidelines. Um, and, in fact, he was also part of the uh, guideline panel for these Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines. So he's very well spoken, and I'm sure he's going to have some very interesting to say, things to say uh, with the data coming out. So I've got about a minute left, but my conclusions are that you go and have a look at these CCS cardiac risk guidelines. They're very interesting, and you're probably going to disagree with some of it, but I think there are some pearls of wisdom in there, and certainly we're going to be hearing a lot more about BNP and tropes, um, and they're going to be a bigger part of our future. I think Mets are potentially going the way of the dodo bird. I did call up Deminda, and Deminda is involved in that, that Mets study that's going to be reporting this year, and he wouldn't tell me so, but I'm kind of getting the feeling that um, it's going to prove to be actually not a very good marker of uh, perioperative cardiac risk. Um, so do yourself a favor and go see Deminda next year. Thank you very much.